Um, you're very, very welcome indeed, especially if you're a visitor uh, among us. Thank you so much for coming today. My name is Reuben. And we're going to turn back to uh, Galatians, which in the Church Bibles is page 1169. Shall I pray before I preach that to us? Father in heaven, thank you so much uh, for the privilege of hearing your word in the Bible. Please would you speak to us by your Holy Spirit. Help us to understand and to respond with faith, to be encouraged, challenged, helped, taught, corrected, whatever we need. And we pray likewise for the children in their groups. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, can we trust the gospel? Last week, in the opening words of Galatians, the Apostle Paul stunned us. He said, I'm astonished that you're so quickly turning away from, sorry, deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. That was chapter 1, verse 6. It was a call to stick 100% with the gospel, with the good news about, what does verse 6 say? About the grace of Christ. That God saves people through grace, a free gift, by faith in Christ Jesus. Praise God. But you might wonder, can we really trust the gospel? Can we really believe the good news about Jesus Christ? Especially in the writing of the Apostle Paul, can we really trust what Paul wrote? There are plenty of stories, uh, perhaps in, in, in films or in books, uh, where someone you thought was a goodie turns out to be a baddie. Um, so can we have the next slide, please, Eleanor? Thank you. So, for example, um, Palpatine in Star Wars looks like a goodie, but sorry for spoiling the ending for you, he turns out to be a baddie. Or Willoughby in Sense and Sensibility uh, looks like a goodie, but he turns out to be a baddie. Uh, or in that TV series, The Traitors, almost everybody, you think they're a goodie, but they turn out to be a baddie. What if the same was true of the Apostle Paul? Could it be that he too turns out to be a baddie? Paul, who pretty much single-handedly evangelized the non-Jewish world. Paul, who um, was perhaps the greatest influence on Christianity apart from Jesus Christ. Can we trust the gospel he taught? Or does he turn out to be a baddie? For many of us, life is tough. At work or school feels like an overstretched balloon waiting to pop. Home life makes us cry. Life can feel like a race to a funeral. And the one thing keeping us going is the Christian gospel, the Christian good news. Or maybe it costs us a lot to be a Christian. Maybe it costs your reputation. Or, or you've given up a lot to be a Christian. Um, or you're putting in a lot of hard work. And either way, we really need to know that the gospel is true. We really need to know that the gospel of peace and hope and joy is true. Because the gospel costs so much and yet it offers so much, we need to be sure. Especially when people start questioning Paul's teaching. You know, how can you trust a message um, that claims to be absolutely true? How can you trust a message that seems so countercultural when it comes to gender or sexuality? Uh, that if it's true, is infinitely better than anything in the world but that demands your whole life. Can we trust the gospel? Well, the answer is yes. We absolutely can. Now, you might say, okay, Reuben, we'll, we'll go home then. But uh, let's see why. Why can we trust the gospel? Two big points why we can trust uh, Paul's gospel. First, because Paul's gospel had divine authority. Paul's gospel has divine authority authority. And this is in the first part of our reading, Galatians 1 verses 11 to 24. Uh, let's pick it up at verse 11. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Paul's gospel has divine authority. You might say, well, Paul, that's Easy to say. Anyone can claim they've got a message of divine authority. How do we know this is true with Paul? Well, suppose Paul's message 
wasn't from God, where would it be from? Uh, well, imagine Paul received his message secondhand from Jesus' disciples, people like Matthew and, um, and John and, P and Peter, and then he just copied it. Well, when could he have received it? Uh, Paul writes these enormous letters after letters after letters. Uh, it would have taken months and months of years, perhaps, to have learned all that from the disciples. When could that have happened? Hannah and I enjoy watching some murder mysteries, like uh, Death in Paradise or, or Beyond Paradise. And you'll know that in a good murder mystery, what you need is an alibi. Uh, you, need, um, you need to be able to show that you weren't there, where, you weren't in the place where the murder happened. It's an alibi. And um, Paul, has Paul got an alibi to show that he wasn't with the disciples, so he couldn't have received the gospel from them? Well, yes, he does. We can have a, just click the button, please, Eleanor. Thank you. Uh, Paul's absence from Jerusalem shows that the gospel has divine authority. His absence, he wasn't there, he wasn't in Jerusalem where the disciples were, so he couldn't have picked it up from them. See, could Paul have received the gospel before he became Christian? Look at verse 13. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my, my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my father. Before Paul became a Christian, he was not sitting adoringly at the disciples' feet, hanging on every word. Uh, he was very zealous in his religion, but he hated the Christians. He was more likely to be locking the disciples up or trying to kill them. So when might Paul have received the gospel from the disciples, not before he became a Christian, uh, was it afterwards, after Paul became a Christian, that he studied perhaps at the Jerusalem Academy for Apostles? Uh, no. Look at verse 16, halfway through verse 16. At my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later I returned to Damascus. Jesus' disciples were in Jerusalem, and when Paul became a Christian, he did not go there. Now you'll remember that Paul saw the light on the road going north from Jerusalem to Damascus, going there to persecute uh, the Christians there. And uh, when Jesus stopped him in his tracks, uh, uh, his, his followers uh, led him on to Damascus. Uh, and then when he could see again, Paul started teaching the gospel. He's become a Christian. He starts teaching the good news about Jesus. And immediately, um, we're told in Acts chapter 9, that uh, the Jews there started persecuting him. And, um, and in fact, the Christians there had to lower him. Can you imagine this? They had to lower him over the wall of Damascus in a basket on a rope so he could escape. Now, in Acts, the story jumps forwards three years. But here, Paul explains that he didn't go straight back to Jerusalem. He went traveling. He kept east of the river Jordan. He went down to Syria. And eventually, uh, eventually, after three years, Paul did visit Jerusalem, but only for a moment, only to meet one or two disciples. And then he was off again, up north to Syria and Cilicia. Look at verse 18. Then after three years in Arabia, I went up to Jerusalem, um, sorry, three years in Arabia and Damascus, I should say. I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas, that's Peter, and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I'm writing to you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. Here is Paul's alibi. I was in Arabia and other far off places where I could not have got the gospel from the disciples. Um, because three years passed until I got round to seeing them in Jerusalem. But I must have got it from somewhere. In 1818, the British explorer John Ross uh, went to uh, the Melville Bay on the west coast of Greenland. 
And amazingly, John Ross found Inuits there, um, Eskimos. And, uh, and he found that they used metal tools. Now, it's bizarre, it was shocking to John Ross that these Inuits were using metal tools. Um, because as far as he knew, he was the first outsider who'd ever been to these Inuits. So where did they get their metal from? They couldn't have got it from other people. They couldn't have mined it. They didn't have the right tools to mine it. But as Sherlock Holmes once said, when you've ruled out the impossible, whatever remains, however, however improbable, must be the truth. The Inuits must have got their metal from outer space. And they actually had. A massive meteorite had landed full of metal, and they'd made their tools. And if Paul couldn't get his gospel from the disciples, whether before he became a Christian or afterwards, where did he get it from? He must have got it by revelation from God, and he actually did. It was God, verse 15, who called me by his grace and was pleased to reveal his son in me. Paul's absence from Jerusalem shows that his gospel has divine authority. So let's stick with Paul's message. Let's stay faithful to it. Shockingly, many senior church leaders in this country are rejecting Paul's teaching, particularly on sex and sexuality. They're the ones, may I say, whose teaching is of human origin. They are blowing floppily, whichever way the current wind of culture blows. And so when they question Paul's authority, when they say, how can you believe that? It's so outdated. It's so politically incorrect. We can and we must believe the Bible. Because unlike them, Paul's message didn't come from people. His gospel had divine authority. And when we struggle, when we struggle with suffering, or we struggle with sin, or we feel the cost of being a Christian, or life feels like a race to a funeral, let's be hugely encouraged that the gospel is true. The message of forgiveness and friendship with God, of eternal life with him as a free gift by faith, is absolutely true because it comes from God. But if Paul had so little contact with Jesus' disciples in Jerusalem, does that mean that his gospel was different from theirs? Was it the disciples' gospel for the Jews, Paul's gospel for the Gentiles, perhaps? Um, now, some religious leaders have done that kind of thing, haven't they? They've said they've got some new and special revelation. Um, was it Joseph Smith? Um, he set up the Mormonism. And Mormonism ends up very different from Christianity um, because of this special revelation which he says that he received. Perhaps the false teachers in Galatia were pretending to correct Paul's teaching by saying that Paul taught something different from the disciples, Peter, James, and John, and so on. And now Paul defends himself and says, absolutely not. We've seen first Paul's absence from Jerusalem shows that his gospel has divine authority. Let's see, secondly and finally, Paul's visit to Jerusalem shows that his gospel has apostolic agreement. Paul's visit to Jerusalem shows that his gospel has apostolic agreement. And this is chapters 2, verses 1 to 10. In other words, all the apostles or disciples, they agreed with Paul's message. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders. I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Paul did eventually pay a proper visit to the apostles in Jerusalem. It wasn't like he was kind of summoned to report to them. Uh, he went in response to a revelation. Uh, we're not sure. Some kind of word of the Lord, possibly the prophecy in Acts chapter 11. Now imagine Paul arriving in Jerusalem, jumping off his donkey and meeting with Peter, John, and James, and the others. Did they shake hands? Don't know how they greeted back then. Anyway, they greeted. And what an amazing moment. Uh, and then Paul explains his gospel in detail to the other apostles. Uh, and he must have realized what an important moment this was in history. See, what if Paul and the other apostles had disagreed with each other 
and couldn't agree on their gospel, well, the church would have been split forever. During the Second World War, in 1943, uh, there was a very important meeting, ironically, in Iran, in Tehran, between uh, leaders of the Allies, so Churchill for the British, Roosevelt for the Americans, and Stalin for the Russians. And um, it was a vital moment. See, what if they didn't agree? If they couldn't agree, um, then the war would be lost. Now, thankfully, those leaders did agree, and the war was won. And wonderfully, the apostles agreed at this Jerusalem conference. Their gospels agreed with each other. Did they have to argue and negotiate? Mm, we'll have this bit if you can have that bit. We'll, we'll, we'll have the Sabbath if you can have circumcision. And no, they didn't. Um, look at verse 6. As for those who were held in high esteem, he, he means the disciples, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, that is Peter, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Did they have to negotiate? No, not at all. They just found that, oh, your gospel, your teaching is the same as our gospel that we're teaching. Now, maybe we're cynical. Maybe we think, oh, come on. Paul, how do we know you're telling the truth? You're telling us this story. Well, Titus, Paul says, look at Titus. I took Titus with me to Jerusalem on that day. Now, Titus isn't a Jew, so he wasn't circumcised. And now, the big issue at this time, and what the false teachers in Galatia were saying, was that Christians have to get circumcised. But if Peter and the other disciples thought that, they'd have made Titus get circumcised. But they didn't. And so Paul's visit to Jerusalem shows that the gospel has apostolic agreement. Well, can you see the apostles hugging each other, perhaps, as they wave goodbye? We may be working in different places with different people facing different problems, but we are one church with one gospel message. And it's a great example to us as we seek to partner to share the gospel. Uh, we are living and witnessing in different places. I'm living and seeking to witness in, in Marlborough, in, in one part of Marlborough. Some of you are living and witnessing in a different part of Marlborough. Others of you are in Pusey or Collingbourne or Perham Down or Burbage or Bedwin or Shelbourne or Hunkford or Foxfield or Ramsbury or Ogbourne or Lillington or Swindon or Highworth or Broad Hinton or Cheryl, or Khan, or East Kennet. And I won't make you put your hand up if I've missed you, but the list could go on. You're studying in all sorts of schools and working in all sorts of places. You're volunteering in all sorts of charities. And I pray that we can all be witnesses in the different places where we are, with the different gifts and personalities that we have. But all sharing the same gospel, the same good news of God's grace or in, um, inviting friends where we can, where, where we're appropriate to hear the gospel, perhaps at the craft night on Tuesday, uh, as the men heard the gospel over their curry night last week. The same good news that other churches are sharing in towns and villages across the country. Our mission partners are also sharing it in Serbia and Kazakhstan. It's very exciting. All around the world, Christians are sharing the same gospel. So there isn't one message for the Jews and another message for the non-Jews. Christianity is not a new religion that disagrees with the Old Testament. We can read and follow Paul's letters with confidence. And if people criticize Paul, we can show them that Paul's message had divine authority and apostolic agreement. And to reject Paul is to reject Jesus Christ, who called him, and to reject the whole shebang. This is so important at our time, when some Christian leaders are listening more to the voices of popular culture than to the voice of God in the Bible. 
when they're offering prayers of blessing for relationships that Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul clearly said are wrong. Let's prayerfully support those Bible-believing brothers and sisters who are contending for the truth in denominations where their leaders have failed to contend for that truth and desperately struggling to know what to do. Let's prayerfully support those of our, our own friends um, who experience in themselves uh, temptations to live in ways that the Bible forbids. Friends who are honorably trying to live repentant lives, often hurting or lonely or not supported by their leaders. Let's be clear and uncompromising in standing with them for the truth. And yet let's be gentle and sensitive with our words and loving and hospitable in welcoming them into our family lives. Those who bravely choose to live God's way at great personal cost. And when our lives are stressful and exhausting or full of tears or full of frowns and when we can't sleep at night, when we feel an overwhelming sense of loss or we're very aware of our own mortality, let us be confident and comforted that the gospel is true. That we can stake our lives firmly on this good news. That this life is just the beginning. That for those who faithfully trust and follow Jesus Christ now, depending entirely on him and not on ourselves, there is coming in the heavenly new creation an eternity of joy for our sorrows and gain for our losses and peace for our fears and justice for our injustices and riches for our poverty and family for our loneliness and life for our death and how much better still of sweet, sweet, sweet fellowship with our dear and almighty Lord and Saviour. So let us put this gospel first above all worldly ambitions. With the final slide, please, down there. Is the Apostle Paul like one of those goodies who actually turns out to be a baddie? No, he's not. His absence from Jerusalem shows that his gospel has divine authority, and his visit to Jerusalem shows that his gospel has apostolic agreement. Shall we trust the gospel that Paul taught that the risen Jesus Christ is Lord? Absolutely, we can and we must for the glory of God the Father. Let me pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for showing us this afternoon that we can have confidence in the gospel, in the good news that the Apostle Paul and the other disciples taught um, as the Lord Jesus taught. Uh, the good news of Christ, his death, his resurrection, that he is Lord and that as we trust in him, we can find forgiveness for our sins and hope for eternity. Please help us that each of us would go away today with our trust in Jesus Christ. For your name's sake. Amen.